Hey people, welcome to Accidental Gods, to the podcast where we believe that another world is still possible, and that together we can make it happen. I'm Amanda Scott, your host, at this place on the web where art meets activism, politics meets philosophy, and science meets spirituality, all in the service of conscious evolution. And my guest this week definitely straddles many of those points. Eva Bishop is a passionate environmentalist and climate activist. She's worked on large-scale renewable energy programmes, run carbon offset schemes, funded a major wetland conservation and catchment restoration initiative, and developed a climate action app and materials for schools on eco-initiatives. But we're talking to her today because Eva is the communications director for the Beaver Trust. I found the Beaver Trust on Twitter. Scrolling through my feed was this picture of a small furry mammal in Britain having been reintroduced. And I had this idea that cute furry mammals, apex parts of some kind of ecosystem, would be an interesting and inspiring podcast, because bringing them back is making major changes, as you'll hear, to the UK landscape and other landscapes around the world. But actually, what I discovered, to my absolute delight, is that the Beaver Trust is about reintroducing beavers, but it is so much more than that. Everybody there understands the need for systemic change, and has ideas and practical applications of how we can do this. The beavers are an integral part of this, but they are a gateway into the much, much larger change that we need. So this has been one of the most inspiring podcasts we've ever done because it has answers. Here are people who are actually making a difference. So people of the podcast, please do welcome Eva Bishop of the Beaver Trust. So Eva Bishop, of the Beaver's Trust, and we just said, Eva, like Beaver, and I couldn't not have that in. Welcome to the Accidental Gods podcast, and thank you for calling in from wherever you are, because the Beaver's Trust, I noticed last night, is registered in Hereford, just down the road from us, like within spitting distance. Oh. But I think you're way down south. I'm in Bristol myself, and thank you very much for having me on. It's an absolute honour to be here. So, you are from the Beaver's Trust, which... I found on Twitter, bizarrely enough, but you're very good at communicating. You are the communications director and you communicate very well on on my social media of choice. Tell us a little bit about how Eva Bishop came to be the person who is the communications director of the Beavers Trust. What's your history and what brought you to this place and this time? Yeah, well, it, it took me a long time to discover who I was and what I'm about. And I'm still doing that, aren't we all? Um, I think that's the beauty of uh, careers and, and life. And I'm ashamed to say I started on a capitalist treadmill consulting and very quickly realized that that wasn't for me. And I turned to um, sport for a year, which gave me the space to think, how do I want to make a difference in the world? And what's motivated me so far in life. And there was this one subject in my business degree called ecological thinking and action. And I and, and that's the only place I got a first. And I really lit up by it. And I thought to myself, you know, I discovered this passion and motivation for tackling climate change. And then I moved via a very circuitous route through carbon offsetting to solar PV installations to a large marine project in the UK, more recently where I set up this massive £100 million ecosystem restoration program that sadly didn't then move to fruition, but, but it really opened my eyes to the need and the dire state of nature in this country. And then I had a brief run at Climate Action Startup myself, wanting to get more parents involved and do individual action for climate. And that led me to a wonderful voluntary team working on Climate Action app, including uh, Peter Kalmus, the inspirational total hero climate scientist over in the States. And then, um, and then I came across this group of friends and acquaintances wanting to do more active conservation in Britain. And I learned about beavers through them. And I thought, yes, here I can make a difference in resilience building because we aren't going to solve the climate crisis, but we can step up and address it. And I think basically the climate emergency has been the foundation for my own pathway for about 15 years. Um, and being a creative person, I've 
ideas shooting off in all directions that I want to be doing, you know, everything at once. Um, and I started a, a circle under the guidance of that book, All We Can Save, which I would recommend to anyone. Yes. Oh, God, it's just so inspiring and, and touches all the ideas that I can't quite elaborate myself. Um, but it sums it up in its first pages. You don't have to know the details of the science to be part of the solution. So for me, this is work is about responding to the emergency um, so that anything I put my energy towards has to be making a difference. And in all, all we can save, there's this poem called To Be of Use, which ends the pitcher cries for water to carry and a person for work that is real. And it sums up my outlook on work. You know, I, I, I need to recognise there's also privilege at play here because to be able to choose what work you do is really privileged in this day and age. And that's a common point of discussion and reflection in our work. But crucially, these guys are coming together around what is now the Beaver Trust. Looked like they were trying to approach life differently, approach work differently. Um, and I'm a mother as well to, to two really bubbly young kids. And I discovered through fairly tough experience that that does a few things to you. It changes your outlook on life, on work and on the future. And it wasn't going to fit with my current working life. And so, you know, if I didn't put my time and energy something worth the effort, I was sacrificing too much by not being with them. Mm. And what I've discovered is working on climate action has resolved that work parenting life balance for me because everything I do at work is for my children, as well as fulfilling the need in me to, to take action. So, yes. And then and then we were we sort of co-built the, this Beaver Trust entity um, and I became a director. And one of the things I really love doing is telling people about beavers and why they're exciting and what we can, you know, and, and climate change and taking more action. So there was a natural leaning towards the communications role for me. So that's so inspiring, utterly inspiring. There are so many avenues I would like to go down <laughs> on this. The, the young mother with kids and how that changed your life and work. I definitely want to come back to that. Um, the fact that we're not going to solve it, but we can step up and address it and all the other associated issues. Definitely, let's come back to that. But before we do that, tell us about why beavers are so important <laughs> and what we're doing, because that's oh, what the Beavers really? Trust is all about. How long have you got? <laughs> well, as long as you want, really. We can make this a multi-episode podcast if we need to. So just head <laughs> off into beaver world and we'll see where we get to. Yeah, um, I think... Beavers are amazing. I think they are this bonkers evolutionary masterpiece of a keystone species um, that shapes its environment to the most magnificent effect. And But the more I learn about them, they the more I think they're one of Mother Nature's finest creations and a total gift to us at this point in time. You know, how do we solve flood and drought? How do we solve biodiversity decline? How do we solve um, carbon sequestration, water quality? Beavers do it all. I mean, obviously they don't do it. They're not a one a silver bullet, but they do have these benefits and they will do it for free once they're in a river system. And that's something very special. So in their dam building efforts, they bring life. And there's been loads of great science, not just in this country, but all across the Northern Hemisphere to show how their dam building activities restore wetlands and create this beautiful, messy, wild, wet habitat that used to be really commonplace before the agricultural revolution. And, and what this habitat supports is the most incredible, almost unbelievable return of species and diversity and abundance, which we've forgotten that used to exist in our landscape. And to stand in a beaver wetland, which they'll create in very short order, nothing else has ever brought me as much hope for the future as, as doing that. And so, and that was part of my decision to sort of move to this role. But then the dams also pre help prevent flooding and drought. So down in the Cornwall Beaver Project, Chris Jones is the farmer there who's seen a 50% reduction in flood peaks, which is massive for the village living downstream that for six years was flooded annually and isn't so much anymore. And it's again, it's not going to resolve it completely, but it's improving it. And then last year, he had a visit from a councillor who said, oh, Chris, I think you've got, in, in the drought last year, who said, Chris, I think you've got the last drop of water in Cornwall here in his beaver <laughs> ponds. You know, there's that kind of, the anecdotal stuff as well as the science just shows how important they are. And then they are fire breaks and they um, filter our water, and they reduce agricultural pollutants. How do they do that? Uh, well, the, the, the dam systems basically are filtration systems. Okay. And the sediment sinks in the beaver ponds and it filters out, again, not 100%, but improves um, the water quality downstream. And what they do, what they tend to do, certainly in headwaters, this is this, these benefits are realised most often in headwaters where the beavers have to build a dam in order to create a depth of about a metre of water so that they feel safe from predators. 
ironically predators that often don't exist anymore in, the, in this day and age you know they're hiding from wolves yeah so that's why they do it and so downstream when rivers are, uh, are deeper anyway they wouldn't do the damming they might burrow into banks and things like that so it's important to recognize that but nonetheless those benefits and, and the potential is there and then there's also the potential for the the wonder and the wilderness that could benefit people as well and we've had people down at Cornwall Beaver Project you know well-being practitioners mm. bringing clients down because of the incredible calming and uplifting response people have to being among beaver ponds which is really cool yes so let's unpick this a little because there's there's so much in this it, it feels like it could be an entire podcast all on its own you could start the beaver trust podcast i think that would be great you don't have one, do you? We do. I missed. You do, and I missed it. Oh, God, I'm so sorry. Right, I'll need to go and find it, and I will link it in the show notes. I'll make myself a note now. It's called The Lodgecast, and you'll love it. It's really fun. Excellent. Um, I was about to say we'll edit this bit out, but we won't. We'll keep it in. <laughs> the Lodgecast, and I will put a link. So people can go and listen to that if they want the data, but let's just see what are we talking about in terms of biodiversity loss? Because even in my own lifespan, I've noticed a massive reduction in the things that I took for granted when I was a child. Our, our grandchildren are not mm. meeting hedgehogs every night. Mm. You know, my, my mother did run a wildlife sanctuary, so I probably had a slightly different world to other people. But even so, there were things, I don't see as many kestrels in the sky as I used to, things that were so ubiquitous. So we're talking explicitly here about wet, wetlands. Do you have numbers for what we have lost so that we can get an idea of what we might regain. Yes, I have some. I mean, there are some interesting figures. Like we've seen since the seventies, I think we've seen ninety-five to ninety-seven percent of our freshwater wetlands have been lost. Oh my God! Because we have yeah, staggering numbers. And when you think of the the importance of those wetlands, just ponds yes. and, and lakes and wider rivers and meandering streams and things like that. Um, because we've drained yeah. our rivers to try and get rid of the water as quickly as possible off our landscape, because that was the view of sort of the um, agricultural movement and, and water companies and all that kind of thing and draining yeah. uh, the Somerset levels and things like that. And we are, you know, there was a very recent report that showed that I think 40% of mammals are at risk of extinction in this country. I mean, I would say 100% yes. of mammals, yes. frankly, given the, the climate emergency. But yeah. you know, that, that from the sci- the pure scientific perspective of right now, that's that's a big figure. Yes, and that's that's because of ecosystem destruction separate to the climate emergency. I'm guessing. I think it's all of it, actually. I mean, there's there's because it. I don't think you can unpick that right yeah, now maybe you could have done 20 yeah, years ago okay. but um but it's habitat yeah. loss for various reasons a lot of it will be farming and and ch- change of land use house building and that kind of stuff but you know hedgerows are a classic example it, yes. my poor children get I, I, they cry when they see the hedges being stripped oh, on, the, on the fields yes. around us and they you know i have a five-year-old last year saying can we write to the farmer and tell him to maybe leave them and i was like yes yes, yes let's do yes, that yes and and it also works. We have a a, a group around here called um, RSVP, Restore Shropshire Verges Project. Oh, lovely. And the wonderful woman who runs that actually does go up to them and go, you have to stop doing this. Yeah. And it explains why. And it because verges and hedgerows kind of go together as are pretty much our last unsprayed, untended wildlife corridors. And yes, they go along the sides of roads, but they don't only go along the sides of roads. Mm. And pretty much single-handedly and, and gaining a lot of hate mail and death threats and the like, they have managed to really make a change to the hedgerows and the verges around here. So it, it does work. Mm-hmm. You just have to have somebody very brave who, who doesn't mind the death threats, which is, I, I hadn't realised about that until I read a, a paper on it recently. But yeah, so yes, we are undergoing, particularly in the UK, it seems that we have a particular skill in taking all of our most advanced militarized technology and applying it mm. to the natural world in an yes. effort to destroy it. <laughs> yeah, it's, quite, it's quite impressive, isn't it, really? It is kind of impressive. I, I read somebody the other day about, about the seas, exactly that. We've taken all of our naval military capacity and decided to wipe out life at, in the oceans. And I had a dream the other night, we will go back to the beaver shortly, but I, this is relevant, where I was explaining to Laura Koonsberg, um about the sperm whales who dive straight down many, 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 many hundreds if not thousands of meters scoop up stuff from the seafloor come straight back up don't get the bends i described this in the dream i don't know why it mattered and then 
release all the stuff at the top. And this is an integral part of the ocean currents mm -hmm. that keep the climate moving. And in my dream, I told her there's only 33 left. You have access to the government. You have to tell them that if we lose this, then you know, basically our entire climatic system is toast. Um, and in the dream, she listened and she went off and did it. I don't think there are just 33 sperm whales left, but there are very much too few. But things now are at the stage where if the people in power don't get it, we haven't got time to replace them with people who do, because by the time yeah. the chance to do that comes around, it's too late. So you guys are actually doing what needs to be done. How difficult or easy was it? How much opposition did you run into from the people who think that the current system is fine? That's a great question. And I think that there's been a huge uh, welcoming sense from many corners. There are always going to be, there will always be opposition to change to a degree and fear of change, particularly on this small overpopulated island or heavily populated island, I should say. So I think, you know, there's concern for change because they are a keystone species they will have disruptive effects on the landscape you know there's no mm. two ways about that and some of that is very positive and some of it can cause conflict with current land use so i think there's um you know there's pushback from land managers there's pushback from politicians and uh, government agencies who think they've got their way of doing things and that's all very well and one of the things that we have to bring to lots of conversations is but this is a climate emergency. We need to make our decisions through the climate lens now and things are going to change anyway. So maybe we should do that with all these net positive, amazingly positive outcomes that are scientifically proven. And it's a, it, there's a lot of education using the generic version of the word to be done um, and information provision. And it's a really, it, it can feel like swimming through treacle sometimes but at the same time the human beings that we speak to are all so receptive to this and and the way we like to work is through collaboration and urgency right. of message and we want to help support communities rather than you know enforce this stuff on them and i think if you do things through yes. collaboration then and genuine collaboration where everyone's equal then it has the best chance of success doesn't it definitely Okay, so I want to come back to the beavers in a moment, but part of what we do on this podcast is look at the social technologies that are available to us for making change happen in a way exactly as you said, that's collaborative and equitable and gives everybody an equal voice. What strategies do you use that work that you think would be useful to share, if any? That's a really hard question. I like it. So there's a really obvious one and a practical one. We're trying to promote and establish a national policy for beavers in England um, so that you know a strategy and, and a management framework so that everyone can treat them the same and they can be accepted back into the landscape and in order to do that the only way to successfully do that is to invite absolutely everyone to the table so that you are discussing the pros and cons of beavers in an unbiased way and just saying let's at least get to a common ground that we can use to create this policy. And I think that we have done that fairly effectively. We're now sadly waiting for the government to produce the policy that we can and consult on it. But last year we held um, a workshop and, and we formed a working group with all parties. So anglers, farmers, scientists, conservationists, um, local community, you know, everyone represented. And that was really successful. And, and we had really lovely positive feedback on the approach there. And we invited speakers who were pro-beaver, anti-beaver, you know, uh, and it was it was a really interesting discussion. So that's a nice example of true collaboration and openness. Yes. And did it evolve into something emotionally literate? My, my projection is you get people in the room who are open about their own biases. I, uh, you know, I think beavers are amazing and wonderful, or I hate beavers and I want to shoot them all. As long as they are open about that, and then enter into a discussion in good heart, where we credit the other side with at least having decent motives, mm. then we can begin to find a space where we can investigate our common values, find out what those common values are, and begin to share them. Does that actually happen? I think to a degree it does, but I think we need to also recognise that people are only human, and they will always bring their own um, emotional 
issues and concerns and, and <laughs> baggage, for want of a better word, to any meeting. Yeah. And it's hard to overcome that. And, and, and so you have to sort of name it and recognize it in the moment. And yes. another thing that we're doing, we're just starting out on, is trying to create these community-led uh, beaver management groups where we meet as a forum and we'll facilitate and help support with the knowledge, but let people speak up for what their, you know, their concerns might be or what their interest is and how they can help support beavers return on a wild catchment uh, wild, wild population on a catchment near them and you're always going to get some people who come and just rant like they yeah. would at a planning forum you know and you have to you have to let them speak and give them room and and decipher what the real issues yes. is if it is real within yes. that and then help address that and if not you know let it go and so there's a i think there's a skill to that and we're learning together with a number of the different organizations around that so it's it's a fascinating process but i think it's you know it's like anything associated with climate it has to be done together otherwise it will fail yes and i'm talking to an increasingly articulate number of people on the podcast we spoke to some a group called braver angels in the us and then trusted people in the uk and it's it seems to me that training the facilitators to be able to help people to find emotional literacy in the moment mm. because a lot of particularly the kinds of people who turn up to meetings to rant yeah, it's a scary place to go. They're used to. I rant at you. You rant at me. Whoever rants loudest wins, and and that's it. And we can't afford to have that anymore. Mm. I'm interested in the fact that you said you wanted to create a national policy for beavers in England. My understanding is that in Scotland there's already a national policy. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how it goes? Yes, I can. So what they've done there is they've legally recognised beavers as a native species. So that's a start. Because they were native. Yes. I mean, the thing we need to tell people is beavers were, were indigenous to here. They were. They were. They were part of everywhere in the Northern Hemisphere. There are hundreds and millions of them. Um, and they were hunted to extinction 400 years ago when life was very different. And their meat, their fur and their castorium was incredibly valuable to life and, and to humans and of course we had the upper hand with hunting equipment so they stood no chance really was it 400 years ago because that's when we had guns I'm, I'm wondering why beavers because we could have hunted badgers to extinction but we haven't i think it's because of the the sort of triple whammy they're so such valuable creatures because they serve this triple purpose so their castorium is both a, a flavoring it's a medicine it's a you know so i think okay. and probably yeah the rest would be conjecture my answer <laughs> Well, you're allowed to conjecture. Go on then, conjecture. What is it about beavers that makes... I was just going to say, maybe it's predictable because they live in a lodge, you know exactly where they're going to be and we can access it. Okay. It might be as simple as that. Yeah, and their fur, they, beaver fur has for a long time and in many continents been a luxury item. Yeah, highly prized because it, they, they create these, this... this um, extremely soft waterproof you know valuable material yeah the, the, looking in the history of beavers is fascinating actually and how uh, we're working with a team of researchers at the moment to look a little bit potentially look at the impact the historical impact of the fur trade for example right on the, how it shapes society and the landscape and, and some of that is absolutely astonishing how how pivotal beavers were to our history and our past and how that's all been forgotten and not just us obviously at north america a lot of the interaction between the the white invaders and the first peoples was was as fur traders. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of that will have been beaver. Exactly. So, um, yeah, interesting. Uh, when when that historical group has met and done all its stuff, we might have another podcast coming up. Yeah, you must. In the meantime, I would like to come back because I got a little bit sidetracked in the the kind of sociology and the politics to the actual practicalities of bringing beavers back so they build their dams which they do by cutting down trees and do they move trees around or do they are they clever enough to cut down a tree that happens to be at the edge of the water and cut it down so it falls across the water let's just go into a little bit of beaver ecology yeah i'll, I'll tell you what i know uh, and there are others that, that are greater experts than i but they do have the ability to do that they do move whole trees they move twigs you know they're, they're such strong creatures it's incredible to see some of the footage um there's a wonderful video of uh, of a beaver carrying you know huge lumps of stone and mud and it looks really almost human with these little paws at the front carrying a huge load and it's just it's just working its way up laboriously and then and then 
pressing it into the dam and it's 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 amazing to see and these these construction that it is so robust um on occasion some of the management of fevers is to remove the dam and it's really hard work you know they've built something right. that can withstand all sorts of no and why are we removing it that sounds criminal oh, because it's one of if the flooding that it creates behind is unwanted it's one of the action possible actions um you can also no. you can notch it so that the water level is managed you can put a um okay. sort of a, a device a flow, flow device through it or you can remove it poor beavers I do, it seems really hard that we bring them back and then we take their dam away yeah. so in the process of reintroduction let's start with down in cornwall where it's been primarily in england do you bring in a pair and then leave them to breed or do you bring in a whole bunch where do you bring them from and what happens in the early years of reintroduction it depends on the site and what beavers are available at that time. So I guess the ideal is that you can bring in a pair because then they will breed and that pair is very carefully matched. My understanding reading the website is that they make for life. They're monogamous. So I'm guessing part of the careful matching is you've got to get a pair that like each other. Yeah. I mean, it must be like humans. You can't just put them together and go, OK, get married, guys. You're going to be fine. You must have a pair that's actually bonded. So we're also talking about understanding the emotional and social lives of beavers yes which must be a whole skill in one itself is finding them and it should you, you could argue it should be part of the animal welfare considerations in translocating them so often these beavers are coming from scotland right. um, where part of the management up there is to translocate them and move them out of an area where they're not wanted and ideally so rasheen campbell palmer is one of the leading experts in, in translocation and beaver management and she will go and seek to trap them in a humane way and move the whole family or right. the pair and obviously you can't necessarily trap them together so it's a process of trying to get the animals and you know and then safely translocate them to the new site mm -hmm. um, and similarly if they are younger then you might try and match a pair and sometimes these new introductions don't work because they don't like each other and they can go their separate ways and it's so it's a, it's it's really interesting to watch but yeah chris got uh, a pair at the cornwall beaver project and it's been amazing to watch them expand and you know ideally we end up with um the gen genetic diversity is one of the core long-term issues and it's genetically at the moment there's a research paper that shows that they're not terribly different so we're gonna it's something we're gonna have to think about in the future right um and there are various solutions to that but it's certainly it's a, and it also adds weight to the controversy around lethal control which is you know it's an important feature of beaver management because we need the ability to address it if it is really difficult so we certainly beaver trust wouldn't advocate to remove that as an option but at the moment numbers aren't high enough that we can afford to kill too many beavers so it's it's really fascinating and the other thing i was going to mention is the sort of uh, we did a film last year called beavers without borders because beavers don't recognise political boundaries. You know, we're one island. We need to think in that mindset. It's very hard at a policy and political level to treat them as in that with that mindset. So, you know, you've got people in Scotland who want to keep beavers in Scotland. And they're right to do that too. But at the moment, um, there aren't necessarily receive, receiving sites right. um, that you can translocate those beavers to. So we might need to bring them down to England and that'll benefit the genetic diversity and things like that. So it's it's really interesting. A complex picture. Yes. And if it goes the way you dream in your best dreams, is it going to be the case that they are as ubiquitous and diverse as any other wildlife form and that there are no restrictions at all? Nobody's trying to lethally remove a beaver. We're just letting them do their thing. I think if everything went right, um, beavers would be commonplace. Yeah. A, a feature of British wildlife like rabbits and deer. And that we have the management structure and resource you know adequately resourced response in place to deal with beaver conflict because it's not going to go away mm. you know the ideal is that there are thousands of beavers in the country and at that point or hundreds of thousands and at that point they will cause issues and so they will need to be managed but that's a lovely place to get to Quite. i mean you, you know what if we can eat beaver again because there are so many of them great <laughs> but you know we're so far off that right now that we need to be really cautious I looked on the website last night and there's something like 125,000 beavers in Poland and we've got like 450 exactly. in the whole of the UK. Um, in places like Poland where there are many hundreds of thousands, are they eating beaver or are they still trying to encourage them to do their thing? 
No, then they're, they're definitely not. But what they are doing is um, letting them be and encourage them to do their own thing. And I think there's something, and again, this is just my own opinion, actually, but I think there is something unique about Britain that we're just not very good at letting go. And I think that, yeah. back to your previous question, I think if everything goes right for Beaver Trust's work, we will start to influence the way um, decision makers think and and land managers and and people view our relationship with nature and right. start to give space to natural processes and wildlife and there's you know one of the things that beavers do is necessitate this thinking about um, rivers and our misuse of those and the water cycle and giving space to nature and one of the campaigns that we're or, or pieces of work and policies that we're looking at at the moment as beaver trust is river buffers to try and reduce that conflict over basically trying to re uh, wiggle our rivers and, and let beavers do their thing because they they need to make them more wild spaces if we're going to reap the benefits of having these creatures back in which case we need to move back a little bit and let them do that so a river buffer is a space on either side of the river where people just stop trying to farm right up to the river's edge. That's exactly it. And it's not it's not so much sort of two metre strips. It's It could be as much as whole floodplains. Right. And so we're starting to look at, through, through a partnership working again, we're starting to look at what the policy and the um, financial incentive to farmers could be that supports that. And it's, again, massively complex. Yeah. But it's the sort of thing that you think, it needs to happen. It's going to solve a lot of the problems that we face. Um, and for me, this is one of the really exciting areas. I think that we have taken our water cycle for granted in such a big way because we're never under any stress in this country. And I think that climate change is going to undermine that. And you know, the science is showing the stress on the water cycle and fresh water. And we need to do something about it because our rivers are in such a dire state. Yes, yes. I read a George Monbiot article at the weekend, which if I remember, I'll put in the show notes um, mm. of the extent to which it's not just the water companies chucking their sewage into the sea, it's agriculture, intensive agriculture, particularly chicken farms, just totally polluting the rivers. So if we have, like the local river, relatively local to here is, is the Wye in Hereford, which I gather has the most chicken farms of the whole of the UK and is basically a toxic mess. Mm. If somebody wanted to reintroduce beavers to the Y, would they even survive? Could they swim in it when it's that toxic? Yeah, I mean, there are there are beavers living in all sorts of um, surprising situations and what they need is adequate, you know, space and food and, and water and they would probably be fine in the Y. In fact, I think there are some on the Y. Okay. And they can help to detoxify it. They can. Again, you're going to see these benefits right up in the headwaters. So, and, and some of the challenges and the pollution happens further down than that so it's it's not as straightforward as saying yay they're going to solve it yes and i don't know the detail and i wouldn't want to um guess at that but but yes in principle that's the sort of direction we should be going but but the other thing about river buffers is is that proper ecological function on a river will dramatically improve the landscape for everyone including farming in an unstable future and it's i think that's what's so fascinating we're, we're looking at the beavers without borders film that we made last year it was directed by nina constable media who is an absolute uh, legend and she is helping us again produce a film this year about around river buffers right. in which we look at some of the challenges and the opportunities and the community voice and the farming voice and 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 the research that we've done for that has been really eye-opening the overall aim of that is to demonstrate the relevance of it mm. to everyone because one of the challenges isn't it that we face yes. is this policy and agriculture and all this kind of stuff can seem really remote to the community or to, to an individual but it really matters and it should, it's everyone's business and um, people need more agency in creating change and addressing climate yes brilliant and particularly again another real obsession on the podcast is systemic change and it sounds to me as if that's where you're heading, that what we have everywhere is a systemic problem rather than a specific problem. Yeah. And I had come to the Beavers Trust thinking, okay, this is going to be really interesting. We can talk about beavers as a very specific and beautiful and wonderful thing to be doing. But what I'm hearing is that you are using the vehicle of the beaver as a way of addressing a much, much bigger systemic issue and getting people to think systemically. That's exactly it. Exactly, it. That's so good. It is, and it and it it leads into one of my favourite areas of um, conversation, which is ed education. 
yes systemic thinking and it's somewhere i'm leaning more and more to still within the beaver trust is um you know education on on the original youth sense and the curriculum you know at last lockdown last year for me shone a very embarrassing spotlight on our education system and the curriculum and what we had to teach at home it's absolutely not fit for the future they're going to face right and I'm just, so I'm wondering how Beaver Trust can help influence and colour the national curriculum through this really cool, engaging, hardworking and relevant animal. And through experience of beaver-influenced wetlands and streams, can we get more children out there? Can we write some curriculum materials around that? You know, much of which has done, been done before by other conservation organisations. But, you know, again, the beaver is this systemic thing and it makes you think that way. And I think that we've, you know, this this concept of, the generational downgrade of expectation of our countryside that we talked a little bit about earlier is something that we can help address. Um, so what should the countryside look like? We walk through it, you know, our beautiful countryside, accepting this bland green field is great scenery. No, it's not. Yeah. It should be way more diverse and enriched. And there's a really brilliant example going on at Sussex University at the moment called Wild Futures, where they are giving 16 to 25 year olds the opportunity to create um their own vision right. of a future landscape uh, that brings them hope right and you know i think that beaver wetlands could probably stretch people's expectations yes. and i think children you know how children are they get so excited about yes. the beauty and wonder of the world and we need to tap yes. into that a bit more yes. don't we yes we've got a five-year-old grandson who's just is an entomologist first of all he oh. knows he knows that he's an entomologist he spent his entire life building bug hotels for specific bugs and he knows what they are and it's amazing watching that sponge of a brain just being systemic mm. and then somehow along the way as we grow older we lose that capacity to think at a systemic level and bringing it back i want to talk to some of the 16 to 21 year olds who are building a better future because my understanding as a creator as a novelist as a screenwriter mm. If we don't give people a vision of how the future could be, they will continue to accept a degradation of today as the only possible future. Yeah, and yeah. That's that's ultimately what climate leadership is about, isn't it? Is is yeah. building a, a, a vision for what could be better and how we can yes. come through this with something worth living for. Yes. How do we get from A to B where B is somewhere we'd actually want to go? Yeah. And we're very, very good at creating the Handmaid's Tale Mad Max you know, we're yeah. all being kebabbed on piles of burning carbon <laughs> tires by our bigger and nastier neighbours, but not good at how the future could be if we got it right. No, exactly. Um, and we need that. So I'll, I'll stop ranting in a moment. No, no, it's good. But I think you say somewhere along the way, just because I think it's really important, this, something you say somewhere along the way, we lose that. Mm. It's school that kills our creativity yes. at the moment. And that is absolutely tragic because that's, you know, our yes. education system is trying to set us up for, for the future that we can't predict. But it's for a completely wrong future. And yes. we've got this extraordinary capacity in children and talent and creativity, and we squash it. Yeah. And so there's something about rewilding children's childhoods yes. and letting them be free and find what that excites and engages them. And one of my um, colleagues, Nikki Saunter, is is heavily involved in the arts. And she she and I often sort of have these sessions of thinking about how we can creatively engage people through beavers. And it's often hard for other people to see how an art session on beavers is going to help make a difference, you know, connect that up with, you know, the, the holistic thinking and practical application of beaver restoration. But it's so important. And it's, yes. again, it's, it speaks to this, you know, I want to do everything at once. And it's so hard. Yes. To <laughs> yes. But you're doing, you know, you're doing such a lot. And you said earlier, you know, everyone in the room is one person. Yes. Which speaks then to the bigger problem is the problem of our political structures and our economic structures, because part of what school is doing is its best effort to turn out people who are fit for an economic structure that is no longer fit for purpose. Yes. We, we don't need to go down that line too much, but I think you know, if you did have a vision of a beaver economy <laughs> that is a different economy, then please do share it. Do you, <laughs> do you stretch that far? Because it seems to me the farmers... Everyone who's doing what they're doing, nobody wakes up in the morning thinking, I want to destroy the ecosystem. No. A, a very few people. They, but a lot of the farmers that I know, so they wake up in the morning and they worry about how to pay the bank. And the only way to pay the bank is to maximise land use. 
spray everything, fertilize everything, create empty food mm. that looks good so people eat it. And the fact that it has a nutrient value, I, I learned a long time ago that the spinach we eat today has 3% mm. of the iron that you know Popeye was eating back in our childhood when he was squirting <laughs> cans of spinach. You should see apples these days, they're pathetic. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. How do we, if, if we don't change the economic system, we will not be able to get people to engage because the imperative of not going bankrupt is bigger than the imperative of I feel good when I see the beavers. Mm, mm. But are you finding in your experience that once the beavers are there, that people are able to find creative ways to help them stay? The landowners, the farmers, the people who might previously have not wanted them do they shift i i think more than that we're we're almost a stage before that so because there aren't that many projects yet but what we definitely see is that people um the first thing we will do is invite people to visit the cornwall beaver project and walk around the beaver site with chris jones who isn't a farmer an organic farmer <laughs> and see firsthand for themselves and the number of times people have completely u-turned their opinion on beavers and farming nice. is speaks volumes um, from all walks of life, whether farmers or agencies or, you know, he, he he would tell an anecdote or 20 about people who now are massive beaver fans. And, really? and again, it's the right animal in the right place. They're not necessarily suitable everywhere right now because they do disrupt. But you have to almost see it to believe it, I think. Right. Uh, right. And then you've got, again, and then, then privilege then comes into it because, as you say, there is this our economy is set up so that people it's very hard for people to, to do good by the environment, sadly. And that's one of the things that we are promoting and challenging and working really hard to reverse through potential new policies under our sort of buffers and, and riparian improvements partnership. Towards this river buffer film that I talked about, we interviewed some farmers and uh, spoke to someone at the National Farmers Union who sort of opened my eyes to the mental health issues behind all of us environmentalists saying you've got to do this you've got to do that you've got to do that and then the prices yes they want to do environmental good but it's so hard because of the complexity and the sy systems and the number of options they've got and somebody somewhere needs to make that easy for farmers to do the right thing yes and simplify it um and therein lies the big challenge but we can't shy away from it because we have to create a better system and so what we get to is we need the politicians either to come and see the Cornwall Beaver Project or at least to understand the urgency and the need to create a system which, to be fair to them, has to then also address all the other yeah. issues that they are being bombarded with. So we have a, a systemic need for change or a need for systemic change. And we need, we need the individual people to stand up for what they believe in as well. <laughs> Yeah, but it seems to me, can we explore a little bit, taking a step back, mm. that what we need to do is find the common value system. Because you're speaking for beavers, somebody else is probably speaking for red kites, someone else is speaking for, I don't know, great crested newts, somebody else is speaking, saying they want the river to be an autonomous being, as they are in Canada, want a river in Canada, a river in New Zealand have been given human rights, which would be utterly amazing. But then at the same time, we have a government paper that came out last week, which came down quite heavily on intensive agriculture, but did say, in some cases, and I quote directly, intensive agriculture, particularly chicken rearing, is the most carbon effective way of producing protein. And I am sure that the people who wrote that, who had been given a remit only to look at how to become carbon neutral, believe what they were saying. Yeah. But you and I both know that, that chicken farms are utterly catastrophic in terms of the environmental impact and the ecosystem degradation. So somehow, somewhere, in a system that seems explicitly designed not to look systemically, except in an extractivist sense, mm. we have to find a way of reaching people and creating systemic thinking amongst those who are not trained to think systemically. Have you thought that one through and have you got an answer? Because I'd be really keen. <laughs> I think if I had an answer, I'd be um, changing the world. Yeah, you wouldn't be here talking to me. That's probably true. No, I think, I mean, you've, you've hit the nail on the head. It is how do you 
And it and it comes down to capitalism, doesn't it, every time? Because everything seems constructed around an individual person or an entity or an organization's need to meet their financial needs. Yeah. And so they become a specialist in something and therefore they can't look systemically. And again, Beaver Trust was actually not set up to be a single species charity. We became this as you've identified because Beaver is a totem for the change we want to see, the systemic change. And what we'd actually like to reach out to all sorts of different walks of life and invite them into this conversation. And often we get pushed back on that. Well, you're Beaver Trust. What are you doing here? What's your relevance? Right. And, and, and you know, that speaks volumes as well, doesn't it? Because yes. people, people already, they, they've got their little pot and they don't look beyond that. And there's yes. huge work to be done to break down those silos. Yeah, you almost need to change your name to I don't know, the Beavers and Rivers Trust or something so that you can, people can get that it's bigger. All righty. So we don't have an answer. We, we're heading down towards the end of our time. I could ask you lots about beavers, but I also would definitely, I will put a link to that beautiful film that's on your website so that people can watch because because you're right just watching beavers being beavers yeah is is just such a heartwarming way to spend <laughs> half an hour of your evening but because we have the capacity to think systemically and because you so clearly do and have done for pretty much all of your professional life how about we riff on opening up the possibility if the world went the way you and I would like it to what is the route from here to a place where your kids, our grandkids, all the future generations are in a world where they wake up in the morning and feel enchanted by the day hmm. that's coming. They have that sense of confidence that the world is an okay place, that they know who they are and their place in it. And they share that confidence with everybody because we, we have to have systemic change such that there aren't those who have the confidence and those who don't, in the way that now we have those who have the money and those who don't. Mm. Have you ever thought your way through that? What a profound question. I mean, oh, if I could move to that world today, I would give anything. <laughs> I think I haven't thought through the question. I mean, I have bits of it and, and things that would relate to it. Something that springs straight to mind is this untapped potential of mothers, actually, and parents and society mm. and the youth of today. I think that there's, for starters, there's more potential to influence and open the minds of the young while they're still, you know, um, malleable or still creative and, and forming. And I think that's really important to address, which I think is why I keep coming back to it personally and for Beaver Trust. Um I think our society can be quite crushing on occasion and even to, to name that and to reflect on it is really important and doesn't happen yeah. enough. The expectations, you know, you could get through your whole life without really living. Um, you can certainly, yes. I can certainly get through a couple of weeks yes. without realising I haven't paused and taken time to reflect and lockdown was widely acclaimed to do that for people, wasn't it? Because they couldn't go into the office and they had to yes. stay at home and, and making space for hope and change is what we need to help people with. Um, coming back to All We Can Save, that, that book for me oh, yes, yes. really helped create space and create a, a circle, this concept of connecting with people to create a circle of supportive love and curiosity about which direction life goes in. And we need to just be less afraid of doing that. Hmm. I think it's got to start with people rolling up their sleeves to to find some good energy and all this stuff, uh, you know, this being willing to make a stand for what they believe in. Mm. Um, but how we get people to think of what they believe in in the first place is a real challenge. And I think, again, it starts in the youth, it starts at school and by brilliant role models. And there are some people who are forming amazing role models these days for young, for young people. How did you do it? Because you clearly did. You started off in business and then it wasn't cutting it. And you got to a place where you are, it sounds to me, you're living a world that feels as if it has meaning to you. Yes. God, it's really nice for, to, to hear that. <laughs> ah, how did I get here? I do not know. I mean, I, I, as I say, it took me a long time to unpick the social constructs around restrictions around living. A long time. 
I mean, I've 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 actually got a, an amazing psychotherapist now who I've been speaking to for about a year who specialises in climate anxiety. Oh, and I mean, I think if we could find a way, and you can you can do this sort of, you know, you can you can really challenge yourself through a conversation with a friend as well. You don't need a specialist. I think people need to talk more. <laughs> and I've been I've been you know exploring this feeling of stuckness, which I actually think might be this idea of pre-TSD over climate fear. I'm so afraid of the future. I'm almost paralyzed by it on occasion. Yeah. The place that I can overcome that is when I'm out in nature or when I'm with my kids, something that overpowers that fear because it's worth it. And I don't know how we reach a lot of people because there are a lot of people, aren't there? And the, the dominant culture is mobile phones and games and, <sighs> yeah. I mean, this is such a such a huge question, Amanda. <laughs> it is, it is, but it's what the podcast's about. And you seem someone who actually could address it. So I was really, really interested in, because that idea that the young people are the answer, and I wonder, there's, there's lots of reasons why the young people are the answer, and partly their brains are still flexible, but partly I spoke to Rob Hopkins, whose book, From What Is to What If, was all about creativity, and that he quoted somebody, I can't remember who, saying neoliberalism, is an imagination annihilator. And there's something about the stress, the just general chronic stress of having to earn a living yes. that shuts down our ability to be creative. You can't be, if we're going to look at things in neurophysiological terms, parasympathetic branch that is where our creativity happens if, you, if your sympathetic system is just on constant high alert. Mm. And the need to earn money or you don't survive is part of that. And the need also, I think, I hadn't really taken on board until I read a blog post just at the weekend by Aaron Bastani of Navarra Media saying, you know, I was walking in Brighton with my partner. I'd just been to visit my dad and I had this strange feeling inside and I realised I felt happy. And he'd been suicidal. He'd certainly been depressed and then put on antidepressants. And he said part of it was that for 15 years I moved, I moved house 24 times because he was in rented accommodation and a complete stranger had the ability to tell him to leave mm. pretty much overnight. And then he and his partner moved out of London and moved to Southampton and were able to buy a house because house prices are better there. And now nobody has the capacity to tell him to leave home. Mm. And I think it's so fundamental to our human existence. We've 64 million years of planetary evolution since the last mass extinction has got us to here. Mm. And in all of that time, we had autonomy and agency un until the last 10,000 years of humans, what we call civilization and what anybody looking from the outside would call spiritual cultural annihilation mm. that basically has always been built around the shoveling of value from the bottom to the top. Mm. And so the systemic way to give people back their agency and autonomy while balancing the rights and responsibilities of living in in the modern culture, but you can't give everybody agency and autonomy if everybody then wants to have 100 acres and a mansion and a private yacht and fly to the moon with a weird hat in their head. Yeah. You know, only Jeff Bezos can do that. But there are beautiful movements coming through, like the Right to Rome and, and Trespass campaign by um, yes. the very brilliant Nick Hayes and uh, Guy Shrubsall at the moment. And it's it's supporting things like that and coming out yeah. and being a number, being another person amongst that that's where it's so important. And that's what we can all do to help help people because there is – and try and redress the balance that has gone wrong. Yeah. Because, you, as you say, you can't suddenly give everybody 100 acres, but you can – manage the access and manage the outputs and the, the financial side of things blows my mind when I try and contemplate it, how you undo the mess of that. And I suspect that's why, you know, it hasn't changed yet because it, no one knows how to unpick all that. No, some very bright people are trying. I listened to a podcast just today called The Death of Neoliberalism. Right. Um, but I also listened to a much more interesting one recently with Daniel Schmachtenberger, who pointed out that very soon, very soon, we're going to have the technology to do the mundane jobs because you may have a couple of weeks where you don't really get a chance to slow down and think, but you and I are not packing shelves in Amazon where we have to pee in a nappy mm. because there isn't a break, where people are giving birth on their work duties because they don't dare ask for time off so that the guy can get to the moon with a 10-gallon hat on. Um, 
But if those jobs don't need people because technology can do them, then the question arises of can we create an economy where the people don't need the jobs? Because why do we? It's not been part of our inheritance. We didn't, you know, indigenous yeah. hunter-gatherer societies don't have jobs. They have life. So we are heading towards the close. You've produced one film, which is beautiful. You're producing another. It does seem to me that particularly in the current era, film is the way that people understand things. Have you got others planned? And if not, let's plan a few. <laughs> I would love to plan a few, particularly with Nina. She's absolutely awesome. Uh, very talented film producer. But um, yeah, we haven't got any others in the pipeline right now, but it's clearly an enjoyable way of communicating what we want to. And I think that, as you say, it's always very well received. We do ha also have this this podcast, and I think we've had some oh, we've had some fascinating guests on that. We had uh, Dr. Amir Khan recently oh. on, on green prescribing and um, some of the nature benefits of, you know, getting into wetlands and things. And that, that, was, that was absolutely brilliant. He's an inspiration. And Gillian Burke, in which we looked at a little bit at sort of the cultural soup and um, the conversation around diversity and how we – think systemically and how we might make change and it's not about um inviting the right people to the table to have that conversation it's about completely yes. redesigning the table itself or removing it and having you know it, it, just these really thought-provoking brilliant wonderful threads of ideas yes. that we all need to pursue and then we've got all sorts of other social media things online and and short videos on i've got ideas to do short videos on educational components and you know and how we can explain why beavers are wonderful and share them with children and lots of ideas yep but that's okay because we just need to get more people to give money to the Beavers Trust so you yeah. can employ more people and make it happen. I can't think of a better way. If anyone has some spare money out there, give it to the Beavers Trust because you're obviously working at such a deep systemic level. It's I'm I'm so inspired and I had no idea when I kind of tripped over you on Twitter that that would be the case. I just thought it would be a fun fun podcast on small furry mammals and actually <laughs> it's been a really inspiring podcast on on the entire systemic change that we need to make and the more people that can hear about this and the more children that can be inspired I listened to a podcast again and recently Ellen MacArthur decided to sail around the world from landlocked Derbyshire where nobody she knew was a sailor at the age of four yeah Amazing. And and then became the youngest and fastest person to sail single-handed around the world. So if the younger generation can be inspired, and if we of the older generations can just manage not to tip ourselves off the edge of the climate catastrophe, um, you know, in time for them to grow up and let that inspiration go, then that would be amazing. Is there anything that we haven't said that you would like to say in closing? I mean, I think we've covered a lot there. Um, nothing, nothing springs out other than I'm thrilled that you can see the um, motivation and the the agenda behind the Beaver Trust because I think it's often really hard to communicate actually in a single sentence. So um, I'm really looking forward to sharing this with people. Brilliant. And we'll get it out and link to all of your social media connections in the show notes. Um, and at some point, I'd love to, let's come back and see where we've got to in maybe a year's time and see how the world has changed and what new things you're doing and how much you've managed to reach the kind of upper echelons of the power structure in ways that inspires them. Thank you. Let's do that. So, Eva Bishop, thank you so much for coming on to the Accidental Gods podcast. A great pleasure. Thank you, Amanda. And that's it for another week. Enormous thanks to Eva and all of the people at the Beaver Trust for being such an inspiration, for understanding the need for systemic change and for spending the days of their lives making it happen. It is so inspiring and we do need some inspiration because this is coming out in the week where it looks like Afghanistan has just moved back several centuries into the medieval period where the Prime Minister of the UK has said that we're going to solve climate change by sorting carbon trees and coal. As if systemic change were not necessary or useful or they even understand how it might happen. And also, in the last week since we recorded with Eva, there has been a Channel 4 documentary on the restoration of beavers in which farmers were proudly displaying how many beavers they had shot. 
So clearly we're at the start of the systemic change, not its end. And what I think all of us need to do is figure out how we can be part of the solution. And a lot of that, I am realising, is in our day-to-day activities. We are part of the problem. We are part of the system. But we can change it. And so, for instance, changing where we buy our food makes a huge difference. If we can be part of the small, non-intensive, regenerative farming system in whatever is our local area, that will make a significant difference. Where we put our money for our food does matter. And way back a century ago, a third of people's incomes went into feeding themselves. And the more I read about this, the more I realise that part of predatory capitalism is cutting food prices and cutting and cutting and cutting so that people pay their money for other things, for the stuff that keeps the system going, for the rents that are harvested by the people who already have huge amounts of money. So it is definitely not cheaper to buy our money from the local community-supported agriculture scheme, but it is what's going to make a difference. So if you only do one thing this week, make it that. And we will be back next week with another conversation. In the meantime, thanks to Cara C for the music at the head and foot and for absolutely stellar sound production. Thanks to Faith Tilleray for the website and all of the tech and thanks to you for listening. If you want more, the website address is accidentalgods.life and if you want to do more than simply joining your local community-supported agriculture scheme, then come along and join the membership. This is where we are trying to find ways where ordinary people can step into interbeing with the web of life because that is what's going to make the complete systemic difference. So come along and join the fun. And if you don't want to do that, on the 5th of September, there's going to be a book club for the podcast with Edgy Temel Curran talking to us at 5 o'clock UK time. There will be an event on the website soon. And that's definitely it. See you next week. Thank you and goodbye.